first of all, um, the posthumor as a concept obviously comes up in two different traditions, just to clarify the notion from a historical perspective. The posthumor, on the one hand, comes up, comes up in critical posthumanism. Critical posthumanism is an outgrowth of postmodern philosophies, a further development. And here the posthuman stands for a non-dualist entity, for a this worldly entity. So here it's a rejection of the posthuman, um, of the human being as a being which consists of an immaterial mind and a material body. So it's a new classification of what the human stands for. The posthuman in another tradition is a posthuman in transhumanism. Transhumanism is, is more closely related to, to the evolutionary, the, to the Anglo-American philosophies. And here the posthuman represents the further development of, of the human being, someone who goes beyond the limits of the currently living human being. And I basically embrace both of these perspectives. I've, I'm developing, I'm working on something which incorporates post-humanist and transhumanist elements. And I both agree, yes, the human is actually is someone which needs to be re, who needs to be reclassified because it's part of entirely part of this world. It has to be redefined as a relational creature. We are not there's we are not categorically separate from this natural world, and we are in a process of, of continuous change. We're integrating new technologies into into who we are. It's not and us becoming cyborgs, us developing further by integrating technology does not mean that we are becoming hybrids in the sense that we are consisting of material parts and non-material parts, because this separation in itself is highly problematic. So the smartphone as our extended mind when we turn into, when we develop as in the process of us developing into post humans as us developing further so the smartphone is not something alien to us is not something um, which consists of um, in a in a different substance but it's actually it's actually it actually has a mind it actually is is a part of us in the same sense as um, as other technological um, developments become an extension of who we are as personalities. So, and that's really a radically new way of thinking about the world. And it's a, it breaks with a, with a tradition, which is, um, which is the foundation of our culture, which has started with Plato and in the ph in philosophical uh, way has ended with Kant. So, um, it is, but it's still determining our culture. So um, the legal constitutions are still founded upon this dualist, categorically dualist ontologies. And that's why this new way of this post-human way of thinking about the world is, is, is facing so many challenges. And that's why so many conservative critics like Francis Fukuyama referred to transhumanism as the world's most dangerous idea. And for someone who's, who's a Christian, a traditional Christian understanding of the world, yeah, it, 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 that's, that's a fair judgment because it does move away, it does break away with this traditional understanding of who we are and with all the ethical implications connected to it. Yes, um, that's a very important question. So here, um, that's basically a question with a technological product, will it always be something which is different from us? So will there ever be an AI which can have the same capacities as a human beings? And that deep, um, this is based upon our understanding that all the life forms which we know today are based on a, on a carbonate basis. They are organically based. So, so far we don't know any life forms which are silicon based. So the basic, and that's the, the most problematic issue. So will it ever be possible for us to transfer something as our personality from, from, a, from a carbonate basis to a silicon basis? Um, and we need to test this. It seems to work. It seems to work so far in, in so far when we consider experiments be, being done by Kevin Boric, for example. So in one case, he was sitting in, 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 in New York, in Columbia University, and he had a brain-computer interface. Um, and just by thinking, he was able to send out information via the internet to his laboratory in, 
in the UK. And there in the UK, he was able to move a hand, a mechanical arm. He was um, able to move that arm towards a table. And on the, on, the, on the fingertips of this mechanical arm, there were sensors. And these sensors felt the surface of the table. They touched the surface of the table. And the sensation was actually sent back via the internet towards the consciousness of Kevin Warwick sitting in New York. And so he basically was able to feel the surface of the table in UK sitting in New York. And this obviously raises the issue. So in principle, it seems what a mechanical arm can do um, is, is just the same thing as what, what an organic arm can do. And further, um, so there doesn't seem to be such a categorical difference between these two types of substances. Um, however, um, whether we can actually upload that, what we call personality, transfer that, what we call personality, onto such a traditionally mechanical basis, non um, um, non-organic basis. This is sort of the tricky issue which needs to be resolved. In principle, something what we refer to as our personality is doesn't have to be dependent on on our substratum because we know every seven years all of our cells get changed. Um, all the cells of our body um, get replaced. And that shows, but we keep our identity, that what we refer to as our personal identity, still remains in, in a continuous existence. So our personality is not dependent exactly on the cells out of which we are constituted, though they can be passed on. The difficult question is whether they can be passed on from, um, from, a, from a carbonate basis to a silicon basis. And there are experiments, as, as the one I was referring to, which seem to make this plausible, but further research is needed to actually check whether we can also transfer our, 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 yeah, our personality onto a computer. Um, the, the question sort of what co constitutes human, um, that still seems to imply that we have a human nature, an unchanging human nature. And that's sort of, I think that's a false assumption. That's actually, that's part of the Platonic Christian Kantian thinking, which we're overcoming by means of this post-human way of thinking. So, just the question of, to, um, just to ask the question, what is actually human? Um, what's the human nature? Is is a misguided question because it seems to imply that we have an eternal nature, some unchanging nature, which makes us human. I would rather say, no, our our nature is if we want to give some hint concerning who we actually are, is uh, our nature co uh, is constituted in our permanent, in, in the permanent process of self-overcoming. So the only essence is the essence of becoming. There is no essence in what constitutes us. But we are in a permanent process of developing further, of changing. Um, we, because we've never um, sort of, at the moment, we classify ourselves as Homo sapiens sapiens, but um, we, we must understand we used to be Homo sapiens. We used to have common ancestors with the currently living apes, apes about five, six, seven million years ago. Um, and so, um, and we've been using new technologies, permanent new technologies, in order to 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 to. Um, to de develop further, I mean, education, being literate, they are all tools, um, they are all enhancement technologies uh, by means of which we, 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 we um, develop new capacities which make our lives more fulfilling, easier, better in some way. And so um, we are tool-making beings, but tool-making beings in the sense, again, without having a permanent un uh, and stable basis, but um, we are in the permanent process of becoming. And, and um, so there's even to, to ask what's the barrier between us and the further developing. Again, I think that's a wrong question to ask. I, I think we're, um, we're permanently developing further and some are already further developed and others may be less developed. And, and, and there, is no, um, there is no stable reference point to which we, we can rely on. And that's what um, that's something um, that's a new way of thinking, moving away from the eternal natures and essences um, which constitute us. And that's partly what we still need to grasp, because there is a 
there's a widespread tendency still of asking what what's the essence of a, of an animal what's the essence of a plant and 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 um that's a platonic christian way of thinking and posthuman thinkers don't believe in these essences regard them as highly implausible okay um there have been that less sort of the basic christian way mm -hmm. yeah uh, of conceptualizing yeah um um let's imagine let's imagine how evolution works what, what's yeah. the problem with us as human beings um so originally there were there was water let's let's really go back um four million uh, four billion years four yeah. and a half billion years the earth has been there there's probably been water around some certain gases have, have been around and some kind of electricity in the sense of of lightnings yeah so initially there was just there was just traditional what we refer to material object suddenly there's a lightning uh, and the lightning combines the water and the gas and and the first types of life were developed life what constitutes life life is is um the, which are, are cells which are self-moving suddenly there are there are entities which are not based on on sort of causal relations but they in itself have a teleology they have self-determined goals and these um which is strange um how, how can they come about just on the basis of, of traditionally unorganic material? And then they develop further, and suddenly there are fishes, and these fishes can see the environment, can perceive they've got feelings, feeling of pain. And then they get out of the water, develop further, and suddenly we can grasp words, languages, communicate, abstract, we can think about the world. We even have, have got self-consciousness. In the sense, self-consciousness, we can recognize ourselves in the mirror, which is really fascinating. And that is all part of the development on, on you know, just some gas, some water, and electricity. And so the, the, the basic philosophical challenge is, how can that happen? How, how can that occur? And the traditional reply was, well, there are different types of souls, and these souls come from outside. God has given us the essence of, 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 of being a human being. It's not actually occurred as part of that evolutionary process, but it's come from outside. There was a human soul, the human rational soul, and there's an, there's an ape soul and, and, a, and a plant soul. Um, and, and this is not... Um, for that purpose, we need that external effect from, from God placing the life within us. That's not really, you know, probably the most plausible explanation, you know. No, and that's why sort of in these post-human ways of thinking is, is, is that, no, um, um, basically that what we refer to as self-consciousness, consciousness, being able to experience, um, that must have always been present in some way. So, which means um, um, that must have even even the capacity to think is present in my microphone, is present in the table before me. Um, maybe there's a, there are simple ways of thinking um, already already in in the computer. So it's nothing alien to the computer, and that's sort of a neo spinozistic uh, way of thinking. Spinoza has already had that understanding. No, um, so there are always there are different aspects to all substantial beings in the world, to all to all beings in the world. So there there are mental aspect attitudes even to the cup of coffee standing in front of you. Um, so that's why it doesn't have to come from outside, a certain God creating the essence of human beings. Um, but there are different nodal points. There are different um, complexities which are being created out of out of uh, out of the very same underlying substance you know some sort of um, by substance I don't mean it's it's mat matter or immaterial um, or non-material substances but there is something which is but the something is not is not something which remains stable but, but which is permanently in the process of change, in the permanently in the process of becoming, um, that's Her Heraclitus, Heraclitian way of thinking. Um, you cannot step into the same river twice. 
Um, and once you embrace this, once you have that uh, way of thinking, it just doesn't make sense anymore to ask for the essence of a human being, the essence of a post-human, the essence of, a, of an orangutan. Um, because um, there are certain, all we have are certain nodal points, contingent nodal points, they come together, certain types of complexity, um, but they in itself don't remain stable. Um, they are again in the permanent process of exchange with the environment, which nowadays could be referred to as also epigenetic processes. Um, so, um, if we if we assume the highest type of identity, high type of Leibnizian identity, sort of ide identity by means of which something remains identical with itself over a certain period of time, we must say no. There is no such identity. We are just Sometimes there seems to be more stability than at other times, but, but if we really consider these things in more detail, all we can see there are permanent processes of becoming, with sometimes contingent null points coming together, but even they are, uh, don't remain stable, even they are in a permanent process of change. Yes, yeah, no, a very important question. Uh, uh, just to imagine sort of how, how we, what types of technologies we're incorporating in us. Um, um, we, we need to see there in basically two different ways which seem particularly promising in us developing forward. On the, on the one hand, um, there's genetic alterations. On the other hand, there are uh, cyborg enhancement technologies. So us getting to, to connect it to first becoming a cyborg and then maybe moving on to us being transferred into artificial intelligence, into us, uh, our minds getting downloaded on computer. Um, the, first, the first direction is very promising as a consequence of CRISPR-Cas9, which is a gene editing technology which um, that has been developed in, in, during the past two years. And sort of, um, for the first time, it has, has become actually a realistic option, even um, germ, germline modifications. For the first time, we can actually take seriously no um, to, to, to that parents or any type of uh, genetic uh, modification will probably become a realistic option within a short period of time. And due to CRISPR-Cas9, genetic modifications have become cheap reliable and precise. So, um, so I see an enormous potential in, in the genetic intervention, which means um, there are different types of um, alteration uh, processes. First, firstly, I think uh, genetic modification. Uh, genetic modification will be a subtype will, um, of, of parental education. The future of parental education lies in the support of genetic modification processes. Secondly, um, there's the option, well, there's a different option of influencing our offspring by means of simply choosing our partner. In the way, by choosing a partner for procreative purposes, we already determine 100% of the genetic make uh, makeup of our offspring. But we've got further options of doing so, namely by selecting selecting fertilized eggs after in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And I think we should use that as well, because there's this structural analogy between us selecting a partner for procreative purposes and choosing a fertilized egg after IVF and PGD, in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The third option here is genetic analysis. Genetic analysis, by means of genetic analysis, um, we can influence, we can have a better grasp of who we are. And we get a lot of information about us as um, concerning the correlations between genes and, and personality traits due to many people delivering their tissue samples um, to, to, to institutions, companies like 23andMe, funded by Google. Um, they are analyzing our genes. They have got an enormous stock of tissue samples. And um, as a consequence, they've got more than a million customers. And as a consequence, they find out a lot of correlations between 
um, genes and specific character traits, how we react to drugs, um, certain capacities. And that's working because we're now having a big gene data. So big data as applied to our genes. So that's of enormous potential and also danger related to it. For example, in Kuwait, Kuwait nowadays is the first country where all the residents and all the citizens are already legally obliged to, to deliver their tissue samples when they enter the country. So this is the genetic side. The other aspect is the cyborg side, artificial intelligence side. And here we see some very striking developments too. Uh, firstly, for example, um, with respect to um, the classes, well, we've got Google Classes. Google is working now on them and in order to, to de develop them further. Now we have Oculus Rift, which is really striking concerning virtual reality. The next step is, we, um, so we've moved from a computer screen towards something which gets closer to our eye. And the next step is it gets inside the eye. How does it get inside the eye? Well, one option is, for example, uh, Google has developed contact lenses, and they're already working. Um, so for for um, for diabetics, um, they normally have to take a um, check their blood sugar level every, every day, um, but they don't need to inject needles every day. They can simply use the contact lenses, and the contact lenses send the information concerning the blood sugar level to their smartphones. So we're moving into the I first with, by means of contact lenses, and the next step is we actually have um, implants, bionic eyes. So it's here moving from, from the media, from, from having a, a dualistic arrangement with us sitting here and the, and the television screen there, which is getting closer within us. The next step, that's concerning visual capacities, auditive, capaci uh, auditive capacities. We've got cochlear implants. So um, for the people who don't who are deaf, they can already use cochlear implants. That's, um, again, becoming us, becoming cyborgs. And these people with cochlear implants, firstly, it enables them to hear. But secondly, they can even hear things which normal human beings cannot hear. It's, it's already possible for them to, to upload programs by means of which they can, they can hear, um, yeah, much higher and lower for frequency, which only maybe some other animals can hear, but us as humans, it's impossible for us as humans to hear that. So um, it's it's not only that they it's a, it's not only the therapy, but it's actually enhancement because they they can adapt their capacity of hearing. That's another way of us getting getting connected uh, with with technologies. We've got further options with, with Mayo, um, Mayo, some straps around the arm so that we don't use the tablet, tablet screen in order to, 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 to access the computer in order to, in order to make decisions on the computer. It's just bodily movements by means of which we can move the cursor uh, around um, uh, in, a, in a computer. And that's sort of a strap around the arm. So here you see um, it's it's not only uh, by means of sort of extent ex so, some external wires of us getting connected to the computer. It's rather the way of the computer getting inside us. Um, so it it might even be more likely um, that the computer is is not something which will be uh, yeah outside of us, but the computer will move into the cells like DNA computing. And, and um, as a consequence of that, um, so far, the like, because the information which we can store within ourselves, the capacity or the, the, the overall amount of, of information we, which we can store there is much higher than what we can store on a silicon basis outside. So the, there's a great likelihood that the future of sort of computing will be in DNA computing, computers moving into our cells. And one step is, is one example of this happening. Um, it's already, I mean, we are moving from, from having a tablet, a tablet, a mobile phone, and now having a watch on the computer by means of which we can check our, our process of our bodily processes, heartbeat, um, temperature and so on. Um, you can already have a chip being implanted on, on the top of your skin. Um, 
and by means of which you can have permanently have your body body functions monitored. So it's it's moving from a from a watch towards something as part of your skin. Next process within your body, and and these are the two processes um, um, by means of which we are moving forward towards the post-human. On the one hand. CRISPR-Cas9 and all the genetic technologies. On the other hand, sort of the computer getting more and more connected to us, to visual functions, auditive functions, and 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 functions of moving the cursor, gestural functions. And uh, it's not the case that the computer will stay outside of us, but the computer is moving, is inside of us. It's being inter integrated in the body, and eventually, I guess, um, gene technologies and 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 computer technologies will merge even further. Once the computers are within our cells, we can use genetic modifications even to, to enhance the computer functions. So um, this is a sort of a wider outlook. But both of the, uh, all, of the, um, all of the developments can, can be supported by means of examples which are already occurring, and, and the potential will be enormous, and we can already see that. It's already taken seriously on a political level, and what we can see on a on a well-informed basis, well, yeah, it seems to be that computers or automate, automation process are actually taking our jobs. So, uh, as a consequence, um, more and more skilled workers are needed in the future. People, people trained uh, both who have the skill of creativity on the one hand and a computer-related skill, so AI skills, programming skills. But the majority of jobs are being automated, and that doesn't only concern people um, on, a, on sort of a less, on a, on a lower qualified jobs, you know, like cleaning, um, uh, cl clean, cleaning personnel, but it also concerns um, much more developed skills like uh, middle management, because many of the, of the um, um, mathematical processes are uh, easily be, being automated, and that's what the middle management is doing. And uh, particularly, what even in, on Wall Street, people, you know, dealing with stocks, they are being replaced by computers. So um, we we see a, 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 ch a significant change occurring. Uh, but in, in in as a general development, there seem to be more jobs seem to be lost, and the ones. We are getting up more highly qualified, uh, dependent on, on creativity, on in, in AI skills and in computer, on programming skills. So that's one of the developments we see. Another another aspect, there are other people who still seem to um, take it into consideration. Well, um, that might not might not actually be the case. We will for every job we have. Um, um, in the present, um, there will be new uh, jobs will be created. There will be new jobs uh, be created by entrepreneurs, by creative people. Um, so that's all the academically trained, the further trained people who used to have that middle management. Um, yeah, they will. There will be a shift in the shop market, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case um, that there will will be an overall loss uh, concerning the jobs. Even though the data, the current data we have, really seems to have a tendency in uh, uh, which which hints at a, at a at an increase of job loss, this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So it might be um, new entre entrepreneurship is actually increasing, and entrepreneurship might lead to a, a greater plurality of new jobs being being created. You know, new programs. Uh, being developed, new um, new technologies, and then these entrepreneurs again need workers to who develop and and uh, who develop these new technologies. So there will be a, a greater plurality of new companies and new types of work. Um, we need to we need to still check and wonder and see into which which of these directions is is more plausible. But uh, in any case, it will. Uh, we know automation will dramatically affect the job market. And as a consequence of that development, we see, well, there is a widespread fear, anxiety, um, because and not only anxiety uh, among the lower qualified um, citizens, but also among the 
you know, the people who studied, you, you know, who, who in the past they were expecting, you know, it's certain I will get a job, I'll be well off, and things will get better in the future. But there's a widespread anxiety. And that, that anxiety is actually uh, more of a, that is one of the central challenges of our time. Because due to this anxiety, um, as a consequence of the automation related to the um, future of work and the automation processes, um, we have a tendency of, of following populist voices, of following people, extremist leaders, who promise to have an easy solution to these challenges. And this is what we're seeing in, you know, in many developed and, 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 and educated and cultured countries in the world. And so on the one hand, this tendency, so the anxiety is related on the one hand, it's related to immigration, other people taking our jobs, maybe coming from outside. On the other hand, computers taking our jobs. Um, and that's why people on all educational levels, on all cultural levels, they seem to suddenly embrace strange populist uh, positions and, and vote for them. And that's one of the greatest dangers we're having. Um, for, for the time being, and we need to have a response. How to deal with the fear? Because in general, we are, we are so the in the technologically progressed countries, um, the education is fine. The education level, people are, are more intelligent than they were 100 years ago, which the Flynn effect, effect confirms. Um, the people are fairly well off. We don't have to be worried of, of starving to death. So financially, we seem to be fine as well. But there is this increased emotionality and fear. And so, and this is the issue we need to deal with. And I think one of the best, one of the best reactions to that might actually be to, to implement that basic stable income. The basic stable income guarantee. And that's been sort of, it's been widely discussed now in Finland. They're trying it out. Actually, they're trying to implement it to check what the consequences will be. But for me, the most, I, I don't think it's a, it, it, it necess, necessarily works on a, on a long time basis. It's a necessarily um, an all, all purpose solution. But we definitely have to take that option seriously, at least, at least in order to, 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 solve the problem of that widespread fear and anxiety because um, this leads to extremists being being voted into office and they will destroy our culture they will and and they will uh, they will increase the tension in between countries and increase the likelihood of wars and that's definitely something which needs to be stopped that's what i think sort of i'm strongly in favor of europe of a unified europe because in the past you know 70 years uh, we've never had a period of time in, in world history um, with so much peace in that region. And peace is such a wonderful thing. And we must not underestimate it, the achievement and all the benefits and the advantages which go along with, with that state. And that's why just in order um, to deal with the fear and to keep sort of a stable attitude to, to, to realize, bring about a st peace of mind of the citizens, um, basic stable um, Basic, basic stable income guarantee, I think, is, is the best way of dealing with that issue for the time being. And it might even be a proper way also for the future if it is the case that computers um, will take more and more of our jobs and research seems to, seems to support that development. It might even be a necessary development also for the fur, for, for, uh, further developments in the future. So um, I, I think... Um, well, we need to still consider what the what the effects, the outcomes of the research will be, um, which is which are being undertaken, for example, in Finland, but probably also in other places in countries of the world. And um, I think that might be, become a necessity um, to deal with this great variety of issues. So, um, job loss as well as just a uh, just a way of creating stability, of uh, peace of mind, and so we can have a a peaceful living together in Europe. The problem with companies, what they can do is, well, the companies are in a, a, a situation of a globalized competition. So for them, it's a matter of existence. 
and of economic growth and flourishing. Um, how can they deal and promote the peace of mind? Well, it's it's difficult. Um, their motivation is is sort of well, firstly to stay alive, and and by staying alive, they need to grow, they need to adapt themselves, um, and um, if if they're not being forced um, by by political circumstances, it they might be lacking the motivation in order to to guarantee the jobs of their employees. Um, there are certain developments which might be a solution or which which uh, might provide a reason what can be done by companies. Well, actually, but 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 that's but this these developments are not unrelated to their own it, intentions. For example, um, it said incre increased interest in, in mindfulness. Um, mindfulness, a, a concept well which originally comes from the Buddhist background. It's a Buddhist virtue. And then there was um, John Kabat-Zinn, he's a physician from University of Massachusetts, 30, 40 years. He's taken that concept and he's integrated it in, in the businesses, in, in companies. And nowadays, I mean, Google, for example, has, has developed a mindfulness center. And they are not only sort of offering their own employees to become do some mindfulness training, but they are also training the trainers. So other companies sending their employees to Google in order to become trainers of mindfulness. And um, um, the, the, um, the intention behind it is, um, um, is, a, is a twofold. It's not only that the, the employees feel, feel better and feel happier about what they're doing. Obviously, the companies are also doing it. Um, if co employees are mindful, then they are concentrated on their job. They are more focused on their, the tasks they have to fulfill. If they are more present and, and focused on their own work, they are more efficient and they work better. On the one hand, they work better. On the other hand, um, the, they have also, they are, as a side effect, as a double effect, they are also feeling better about themselves. So, um, so the companies wouldn't do anything which is solely in the employees', in, employees interest. So uh, when uh, whenever you ask for what can the companies do, it needs to be something which is both and primarily in uh, the company's interest, but secondarily also in the employee's interest. And I think actually the mindfulness programs which are being implemented are a good way of also coping with uh, many of that um, emotional, uh, people getting um, fearful and emotional because mindfulness is such a state of, of being focused on yourself, as being more concentrated, as being more, get, being less distracted. So I think the mindfulness programs are, are wonderful, uh, are wonderful of dealing also with the great variety of challenges we are, we are confronted with and it, they increase also to um, to deal to reduce the widespread fears we are, we are currently facing. A further option actually could be, and that's again another transhumanist um, uh, transhumanist attitude or transhumanist offer, how to deal with mindfulness, is also to include radical mindfulness. Radical mindfulness means um, the attitude or the virtue of mindfulness is, um, cannot only be integrated by bodily practices or by certain repetitions, by, by certain things you do, by bodily procedures, but they can also be promoted by pharmacological means. So basically by, and research has confirmed that, that nicotine, modafinil, ritalin, certain drugs, certain pharmacies, they can promote attitudes or states of mind which are similar to the ones um, which are also being promoted by meditation techniques which um, lead to mindfulness. And this is actually very much in tune with the traditional procedure or the tra traditional mindfulness training which comes, from a, which comes from a Buddhist background. And one good example, I think it's a wonderful example which shows the multiplicity of effects related to mindfulness, is that of a tea ceremony. In a tea ceremony, on the one hand, you have the external cir circumstances which matter. What matters? You have a, you have a small table. You have a, you have a pond with a with a koi carp inside. You have the right outer setting, which is important. Secondly, you have the 
tea ceremony insofar you have a teapot and then you pour the tea firstly into a smelling glass, into a smelling cup, and that's just in order to perceive the smell of the tea. Then you put the cup into a drinking cup. It's a different shaped cup in order to be aware of the altered taste of the taste of the of the of the tea. So here it's that's sort of the bodily training. That's a, a certain tradition, a certain ritual, what you're doing in order, a certain corresponding to traditional meditation technique. But we mustn't underestimate that, as it's the case in the tea ceremony, the tea in itself also have, has a role. The tea affects our consciousness. That's a type of pharmacologically induced mindfulness. So even in the traditional tea ceremony, we've got a certain drug which has an effect upon us. It is a bodily training, and it is the outer setting. And, and that's why I think mindfulness is a wonderful uh, offer by companies, which is in their own interest in order to make workers more more focused on their work, but also promoting their own well-being, their own uh, uh, way of getting rid of their anxiety, of their emotional states, and be more, you know, be, be more in tune, um, more resonated with the world, more in tune with the world. And... Um, in addition to the traditional techniques, I think they could also further be supplemented to mindfulness drugs, um, which we already partly have, but which could still be, be developed in the future. I mean, the, the amount of advantages already available is, is enormous. And you, you um, I, will, I will just maybe present a few examples which from my perspective are the most interesting ones for the for the time being um, firstly I would one example is something researchers in the Netherlands have developed and and they've managed to create a, a zebra fish they've genetically engineered a zebra fish such that it um, has the capacity of getting nourishment by means of photosynthesis so um, as a consequence, they don't have to rely on food, but they can actually get 20% of the food by means of photosynthesis. So um, the quality which only plants used to have is now being held by the zebra fishes. Zebra fishes, and, and it works. I mean, this is not science fiction. That's already science fact. That's something um, which they've established. And zebra fishes genetically are not so different from human beings. So it, it basically means well, that might be a way of solving the, the nourishment problem. That might be a way of dealing if we fly to outer space on a Mars mission. Um, we, we, we would be dependent on, on, on our nourishment. We, there would be a way of how to get food on a reliable basis. So, But if we get at least part of our nourishment by means of photosynthesis, that would be a wonderful solution. Also, um, given the increase of the expected increase of the population and, and the sort of risk of overpopulation, which is another very central risk associated to the to the new technologies and the increased lifespan which goes along with it. So I think that's a wonderful example of, of science fact which could have enormous impact on our society. Another issue I would uh, I would love to refer to is that of yeah is, is that merger between between genetic analysis and big gene data, between AI and 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 a genetic analysis, because so many many people sending away their information, their tissue samples, in order to have them analyzed. Because in most cases, they want to know more about their own past, their ancestry. You know, you know, you know. You suddenly find out you're ten percent Arabian, fifty percent from Scandinavian country. Yeah, it might give you new understanding of, you know, your yourself, who you are, your background, your self-understanding. However, on the other hand, it provides companies with a lot of information concerning the correlation between individuals' genes and what they can do. And on that basis, and the more information we have, uh, the more reliable are the predictions on the basis of a gene analysis. Um, your entire genome can now be analyzed uh, for, for, for 1,000 US dollar. A simple gene analysis now costs you can get one for hundred dollar. Different companies who offers more um, charges five hundred dollars. 
So, um, and they can make a prediction about your capacities, about the likelihood of you getting certain diseases, how you respond to certain drugs. So the, it's, it's very beneficial for you individually to having such an analysis. On the other hand, it would be of enormous interest for your future employer. Insurance companies would be extremely interested in getting hold of that data. So uh, this is a challenge. This is a challenge we're now facing. And the challenge gets even worse when we take into consideration, well, it's, it's a privacy issue. But the privacy issue, uh, it's not a traditional privacy issue. Because traditionally, well, you could say, well, who, who, who's the owner of the results of your genetic analysis? Normally, well, they are my genes. I am the owner of, that, of this information. On the other hand, well, these information, some companies actually claim ownership of, of the results of a gene analysis because what they are doing is to extract the information from the genes. They, they, they do work with your genes. And doing work, mixing work with something is actually the Lockean basis of becoming an owner of something. Intellectual property rights are being founded on this basis. That's one option. Another option would be, would it, uh, it still uh, mustn't be the case that it's just you who is the owner. Let's say, okay, let's assume now you're, it's, it's your information, you're the owner. Then you should be able to do, do with it whatever you want to do. For example, to, to publish the results of a gene analysis online for further research. You want to promote research. You want to public, make it, uh, the information about your genes accessible for all the other researchers. However, uh, the you've got a sister, a biologically related sister. You've got your, you know, parents, and you're sharing most of the genetic properties with them. So, as a consequence, the insurance companies, you know, your sister wants to take out a new life insurance, and she sees, well, the company sees you, you, you know, you, you've, you, you've made your information accessible to to everyone, and they see, well, there's an increased risk of Alzheimer's. A high, much higher probability than the average. Though they tell the, 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 your sister, I'm sorry, unfortunately we can't take you, or the, the fees will, will be increased. So this will be, have an enormous influence on how society works. And um, as we've seen with the case, well, there's this case which I mentioned before concerning, concerning Kuwait, who's already made it legally obligatory for residents and visitors to deliver the tissue samples, by means of which they get enormous stuff of genetic information. And it's very likely that that will happen in the future also to, well, in, in other countries, and maybe become obligatory directly after birth, maybe even before birth, um, to deliver some of your tissue samples. And that will, so that will radically change the way our society works. How the prerequisites of taking a job, the prerequisites of the insurance company. So, um, and that's not again all of these. The method, all of the technological means are already there. They're just not yet applied in that manner, but they could easily apply in that way. And so, this is another something, another development which we we, we desperately have to reflect upon and have to take seriously. That's why. Um, this is an, another example I really wish to highlight and I want to encourage people thinking about it because otherwise it, it will be just be done without our basis and be used against us and so further public discussion is desperately needed on these issues.